a pandemic that has claimed thousands of lives and has caused tens of others to be infected. In Africa, the virus has spread to a number of countries. Governments and healthcare authorities across the continent are striving to limit widespread infections. The aim of this webinar is to outline the economic outlook of Africa post the COVID-19 pandemic, identifying challenges and opportunities that will exist. We will also touch on the new African continental free trade area and its impact on the continent. The African continental free trade area was created by the African continental free trade agreement among the African Union nations. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, you are welcome. I would like to express our gratitude to each and every one of you for your support of Brand South Africa and for your commitment to the continent of Africa as a whole. Let me set the context for our e-meeting today. Globally, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is the OECD, noted that annual global GDP growth is projected to drop to 2.4% in 2020 as a whole, from an already weak 2.9%. And the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, which is OPEC, has dramatically reduced its outlook for all demand this year as a result of the virus due to a decline in consumption. What we've seen globally is that there have been disruptions in the global supply chains and in global trade, as it were. Therefore, the COVID-19 pandemic has taken a toll on human life and it has brought major disruption across the world, where we see economies contracting. Africa is not immune to this. It's not immune to what is happening globally. So let me zoom down to Africa. The World Bank has released its biannual Africa Pulse report, which takes a macroeconomic outlook for Africa, particularly the sub-Saharan region in, Af in Africa. The World Bank projects that as a result of the pandemic, Africa will decline from the 2.4%, which it was in 2019, to between minus 2.1% and minus 5.1%, depending on the success of the measures taken to mitigate the effects of this pandemic. There are many organizations who have given their predictions on Africa, including rating agencies. McKinsey's analysis of COVID-19 pande uh, pandemic and its impact on the economy is that Africa's GDP growth could be cut by three to eight percentage points. But what gives comfort is that GDP growth in Africa is projected to recover to positive levels by 2021, according to the World Bank report. What we see across the continent is that leaders in the public, in the private, and in the, in the developmental sectors are already taking decisive action to, number one, save lives, and number two, protect households, protect businesses, and protect national economies from the fallout of this pandemic. Several African countries have already acted to inject liquidity into their economies, to reduce interest rates, to help businesses survive the crisis, and to support households' economic welfare. And in many cases, this has been done uh, through the assistance and the active involvement and support of the private sector. Yesterday, ladies and gentlemen, the 25th of May, it was Africa Day. And the African Union Chairperson, His Excellency, President Cyril Ramaphosa, held a virtual celebration of this significant day. This year's Africa Day was marked in the shadow of coronavirus. His Excellency, President Ramaphosa, highlighted Africa's coronavirus response, including his appointing of um, the special envoys in this regard. 
What is clear is that the African Union's Agenda 2063 is a representative of the shared energy and excitement around Africa's potential. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce the panelists to you. If I may remind you, the topic for today is Africa Economic Outlook post-COVID-19, the challenges and opportunities. Our panelists are His Excellency, Mr. Wamkele Mene, who is the Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat, the largest free trade zone since the advent of the World Trade Organization, that is WTO. We have Ronak Gobaltas, who is a political economist, a writer, a speaker, and a director at Signal Risk. We have Graham Codrington, who is a futurist, a speaker, a facilitator, board advisor, and an expert on the future of work through his organization, Tomorrow Today Global. We also have Dr. Anthony Coleman, a senior manager and a principal research economist at the African Export Import Bank, that is Afrexim Bank. We also have Agnes Gitau, a partner at GBS Africa, which is a development-focused advisory firm. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the detailed bios of the, of the, of the panelists, which are on this platform, shared as a PDF file uh, in your screens. And on that note, I'd like to encourage everyone to participate in the chat box but um, and, and ask your questions, knowing that after all the speakers have spoken, we will have a session for question and answers where you can ask the, the relevant speakers the questions that are in your mind. But without further ado, let me welcome His Excellency, Mr. Wankele Mene, to give us his address. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pumela, and thank you to Brand South Africa for, for organizing this event and, and for uh, inviting the AFCFTA Secretariat and, and of course, for inviting me to, uh, um, to share some of our views about uh, COVID-19, its impact on, uh, on Africa, the African continental free trade area, and what possibly, uh, what steps we could take post COVID-19 uh, to mitigate the impact on, um, on Africa. I think you have in, in your remarks, you have set out uh, uh, already what the, the, the projections are in terms of economic growth or what was expected to be Africa's uh, economic growth uh, this year. Um, if we had not had COVID-19, uh, uh, some of the figures I have seen range from 2.5% growth to 4.1% uh, uh, growth that was projected for, for Africa this year. And of course, as you say, uh, because of the impact of COVID-19, um, we, we should brace ourselves for uh, 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 declines of up to 5.1% according to um, the World Bank study that uh, uh, you mentioned. This is, of course, for, for, for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the, it, this is a, a source of concern for Africa because uh, if you look, for example, at the services sector, uh, the airline industry, uh, hospitality industry in Africa, which was a significant contributor to Africa's GDP, we now expect that there will be declines of between 20 to 30 percent in economic activity in uh, the services sector. Uh, second, we expect as a result of COVID-19 that our exports will uh, decrease by uh, 32 percent uh, because we are uh, structurally, structurally reliant on exports to traditional markets. 53 percent of our exports go to uh, traditional markets of the north, intra-Africa trade is at only 18 percent, and so this is uh, uh, this has exposed Africa's uh, weakness in terms of uh, uh, trading and global supply 
reliance on global supply uh, uh, trading links rather than uh, intra-Africa trade. We also have seen um, uh, uh, FDI uh, uh, decreasing uh, into Africa in the last uh, two months, which of course is is something that um, that is to be that is to be expected, given the circumstances. And so overall, um, the the picture that we have in Africa is is not a positive one, and this will, this has an impact on the African continental free trade area in a number of ways. Uh, first, uh, countries are in response to the pandemic, uh, are either in partial or full lockdown. 42 countries in Africa are either in partial or full lockdown, which means that the borders are closed, which means that there is no uh, trade that is taking place uh, between and amongst African countries, even in, in the context of regions. Uh, the, the borders remain closed because countries are focused on, on fighting the pandemic. Uh, it also means that uh, as we had intended to start trading on the 1st of July, we may not be able to start trading on the 1st of July under the AFCFTA because of uh, conditions uh, that are not conducive uh, uh, to trade. And in this regard, the heads of states are considering um, the matter of the 1st of July as a trading date, but obviously, uh, as all of us can see, uh, borders are closed and uh, countries are focused on fighting the pandemic. So let me, let me just uh, uh, um, set out how Africa is responding to this uh, pandemic. There's a short-term strategy and then, of course, there's a long-term strategy. Um, in the short-term, the Assembly of Heads of States, the Bureau of the Assembly of Heads of States, uh, uh, has established a, a COVID uh, solidarity fund, uh, which is uh, has raised a substantial amount of money. Obviously, uh, you can never have enough resources, uh, but money is being raised to assist uh, um, to the effort of a coordinated fight against the pandemic. We are working very closely with the, uh, and in fact, the African Union Center for Disease Control is leading uh, the, the uh, coordination of the efforts to fight the pandemic across um, uh, the, 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 the African continent, because as you know, uh, we are at, at different levels of public health uh, readiness uh, to fight the pandemic. And so the role of the African Union Center for Disease Control is, is critical. The second uh, uh, response, short-term response by the African Union, uh, in particular the heads of states, is the establishment of a trade corridor. And the trade corridor is very important um, for enabling the transit of essential goods um, so that the, even when the borders are closed, uh, the goods are still able to, to, to reach uh, countries that are landlocked, for example, and that populations up and down the African continent, all over the African continent, can have access to, um, to the, the, the goods that are essential for fighting the pandemic. There is also a long-term uh, strategy. One, we have got to be less reliant on global supply chains without disconnecting from global supply chains. We have to establish our own regional value chains um, as Africans, we have to make sure that we establish our own manufacturing and productive capacity um, so that we, we, we are less uh, reliant on um, partners, uh, on, on trading partners uh, who we see now when their, their economies suffer because they are our export market, we suffer even more. So we've got to make sure that we enhance our regional industrial development capacity and implement regional value chain strategies all uh, African continent so that we can produce uh, not just for this pandemic but any future pandemic we produce the equipment that is necessary here in Africa the ventilators we produce here in Africa the the, the masks and in this regard we have already started seeing uh, production of masks in Kenya, in Egypt, uh, in Senegal, and, and so on. So 
in the long term, as a response, it is very important to reconfigure our supply chains and to establish a, uh, a regional industrial uh, strategy that will take into account Africa's industrial development objectives and the need to accelerate uh, our manufacturing capacity. Second, in the long term, we have to relook at our intellectual property rights regime. We have got to make an assessment of does the existing intellectual property rights regime, does it serve Africa's public health objectives? Does it serve Africa's industrial development imperatives? I am talking here now uh, in particular about uh, uh, patents. To what extent does our patents regime uh, foster or facilitate the development of a generic drug industry in Africa? so that we are able to ensure access to affordable health care, good quality, affordable health care for all Africans. And second, um, whilst addressing the public health uh, uh, needs, we are also through the generic drug industry, we are also uh, in manufacturing uh, of generic drugs in Africa, we're also able to advance our industrial development um, objectives. And so uh, the, the issue of pharmaceuticals is, is absolutely critical for us to address, not only in this pandemic, but as we, as we go uh, uh, forward and, and face future pandemics. Last year, 2019, Africa imported $15 billion worth of pharmaceuticals. This is a, um, a very serious challenge to us as Africans, uh, as I say, to review our intellectual property uh, uh, regime and uh, to put it at the service of Africa's industrial development objectives and to put it at the service of Africa's public health uh, objectives. Now, we, the question I think uh, that is immediate is uh, what does this mean? What does all of this mean for the African continental free trade area? Um, when are we going to, in earnest, be able to say that we are benefiting from, uh, from this agreement? I think part of, um, the, part of the answer to that, of course, is the pandemic, because we don't know what will happen in two or three months time. But what we do know is that the AFCFTA has got to be uh, Africa's economic recovery plan. Post COVID-19, uh, we have to implement the AFCFTA in such a way, in such, in such an aggressive way that it, we actually do uh, see an improvement in intra-Africa trade from the 18% where it stands at, at the moment. So that year on year from 2021, uh, we see the AFCFTA as one of the tools, one of the drivers of um, a recovery, an economic recovery um, in Africa, and is actually one of uh, 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 is one of the tools that drives uh, economic dynamism in Africa. Uh, we don't have, and I've been saying this through the last uh, month or so. As Africa, we do not have uh, the um, uh, the luxury, whether in a, in a sense of monetary policy space or in the sense of uh, fiscal policy space, we don't have the luxury of providing, you know, over a trillion dollars worth of a stimulus package um, uh, to inject uh, uh, growth in the economy, uh, as we have seen in the United States, and as we have seen also in, in the European Union and other countries around the world. So Africa's coordinated um, an integral part of Africa's coordinated economic recovery has got to be implementation of this uh, African continental free trade area so that we boost intra-Africa trade and so that we are actually, uh, we, we, place, um, we place Africa on a path to, to higher value added production by developing the value chains that, um, that I have spoken about um, earlier. So, uh, as I conclude, uh, uh, Pumela, let me, let me just again emphasize 
that it is absolutely essential that we implement this agreement and we implement it in such a way that it is the driver of Africa's economic recovery um, and that it, 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 in, it enhances Africa's investor uh, uh, climate because we will now be implementing a single set of rules for trade and, and investment uh, in Africa. So thank you very much for the invitation and, and I, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for sharing with us how Africa is responding to this pandemic, both in the short term and in the long term, and how this also provides opportunities across various sectors of the economy, uh, from pharmaceuticals to retail and other sectors of the economy, including the very notion of Africa regional integration. And you are giving us hope, Your Excellency, when you say that this Africa uh, continental free trade agreement will be the driver of Africa's economic recovery. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. On that note, I would like to invite uh, Ronak Kobaltas to share with us, you know, what the, what the political economy outlook will be for Africa post COVID-19. Thanks very much, Pamela, and thanks to Brand SA for having me, um, and uh, welcome to the, the audience as well. Uh, I'm going to tackle three issues today. The politics of elections, the politics of debt, and the politics of Africa-China relations. Uh, and I'll keep it short and snappy, uh, but try to cover a lot of content. So I think the, the issue of elections is, is one that is dominating discussions across the African continent at the moment. Will elections happen? Will they not? Um, and you know, we're, we're seeing a bit of a mixed bag on that front. We know that Ethiopia has already postponed its elections, which were meant to happen in August. Um, but we know that Tanzania, for example, is going to go ahead with its election. And the jury is still out on, on places like Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. Um, I think with regards to elections, we're seeing a few interesting dynamics. We know, of course, that the logistics are going to be tricky in light of the security concerns that we're having uh, at the moment in light of the coronavirus pandemic. Social distancing is a big issue. And then, of course, there are associated costs involved with ele elections. If these elections do go ahead, will they be credible? Will governments be able to gain legitimacy? Or are they going to be sullied by the fact that the opposition can't campaign and that they are not done in a proper way? Um, so, you know, these are discussions that are ongoing at the moment, and we're seeing, as I've mentioned, uh, a bit of a mixed bag. But what we're also seeing on the on the election front is this tendency towards authoritarian opportunism, where we're seeing that the healthcare sector has been politicized and securitized in many countries, uh, where this is effectively an excuse to expand executive power, to curtail civil liberties, to clamp down on the opposition, to enhance surveillance, uh, and it really plays into an abuse of power, which is something that we need to guard against um, in light of, uh, of, of what's currently happening. Um, the third aspect in and around elections that I think is important is this question of accountability, because what we could have happening is elections serving as effectively a referendum of the way that the pandemic has been managed. It could see, if done properly, uh, a more close relationship between governments and their citizens, uh, we're already seeing greater business and government collaboration. And my hope is that it changes the landscape of our politics towards a more performance driven one where the social contract between the governments and their citizens is enhanced rather than ruptured. So that's kind of the, the take on, on the politics of elections. Um, moving on, I'd like to kind of move to the, the question of the politics of debt. And this is this is a really really tricky subject at the moment, uh, because most African countries have effectively been hit by this trifecta of, of shocks. So you've got a commodity price shock, you've got the coronavirus, and then you've got a shock of confidence, which has led to capital flight. And that's unleashed some pretty dire economic consequences. We are said to have our first recession on the continent in 25 years, according to the IMF, and that puts many countries in the horns of a very real dilemma. Do you spend money on servicing your interest payments to creditors, or do you spend money on your domestic population, on healthcare, in order to ensure their survival? Um, and this has created an effective gridlock at the moment where African countries 
who are cash strapped are faced with three policy options here default, restructure, or standstill. Um, now, if you look at the response from private creditors, what you've had over here is effectively um, some skepticism because they're worried around the issue of moral hazard. They're saying that this is being used by a get out of jail free card by countries who were already being fiscally reckless before. Um, so there's some resistance there. But in the same breath, uh, many African countries are now saying that uh, you know, this is an external shock. It's not their fault. And effectively, if creditors push for their payments at these exorbitant levels, they're effectively going to have blood on their hands. And this is where I think the collective African response has been very good in the sense that we've taken a common negotiating position and the safety by numbers approach has, has really allowed us to exercise moral suasion uh, in, this, in this dilemma. I think looking forward, you know, it's going to be a tricky set of compromises. Um, the solutions will have to require some compromise, will require pragmatism, because uh, if both sides remain reticent, what we're going to have is this, the equivalent of a, a bar fight, and that's going to have disastrous consequences and really compromise the long-term uh, trajectory, both economically and politically for the continent. Uh, the third issue I'd like to touch on is the issue of the politics of China, Africa. Um, and that's come under the microscope in recent times, uh, may, mostly because of the controversy that we've seen as a result of the xenophobic attacks um, in Guangzhou province in, in China on black African students. And people are now asking the question as to whether the close strategic relationship between China and Africa is going to be compromised. Um, you've had a few other incidents which, which have kind of also created this negative sentiment, you know, allegations of debt trap diplomacy, that China is, is lending in a very predatory way in order to, to gain strategic assets, which it knows that countries can't pay back. Um, then there's, you know, there's a narrative that's forming that China needs to pay reparations to African countries as a result of the fact that the, the virus originated in China. Um, but I think, you know, China will exercise diplomatic and economic levers in order to smooth this out. I think the, the narrative around China uh, suddenly abandoning all the geostrategic and geopolitical value that it's built across Africa is somewhat premature. And yes, while in the short term it may focus on stimulating its domestic economy, um, I think it still has very significant international ambitions. So the Belt and Road Initiative is going to remain a key pillar of its, of its strategy. Um, you know, at the end of the day, China needs Africa and Africa needs China. We're already seeing in terms of healthcare diplomacy with Jack Ma um, and the likes supplying uh, medical supplies to, to many African countries, as well as uh, China now agreeing to compromise on some of its bilateral debt towards the African continent, um, that this relationship uh, is going to remain strong. We know Chinese are chess players. They play the long game and they're not going to let this advantage slip, particularly as many African countries are now tapping the IMF funding sources um, and, and some of the, the more traditional uh, sources of funding as well. So I think this really does present an opportunity to recalibrate the relationship to more of a win win partnership. Um, so another space to watch quite closely. And I think in the interest of time, I'm going to, to leave it there. Ronald, for you, for those insights about um, the politics of elections, the politics of debt, and the politics of China, I'm sure we could have another session just on those with the audience also engaging in that regard. But we would also like to encourage you as the audience to send the questions through. We've had some that are coming through, but we will share them later after all the speakers have um, spoken. And on that note, let me welcome Graham Codrington, who is a futurist? Not many people are futurists. Not many people are able to tell us what is likely to happen into the future. Uh, he will share his insights on the future of work post COVID-19. Over to you, Graham. Thank you, Pamela, and uh, hello to everybody uh, who is joining us. It's great to have you with us. Uh, 
I, uh, Pumela was kind of in her voice. She was talking uh, about a futurist, and it, and it sounded, you know, at, as she said, there's not many people who have that as their uh, label or, or on their business card. Uh, my mother still wants to know when I'm going to get a real job. So you're not alone, uh, Pumela. Uh, what a futurist does, of course, is we don't predict the future. I, I wish that we could. What a futurist does is look at scenarios. And in terms of the scenarios for Africa over the next few years, uh, there are a few things to be clear about. We've already heard Pumela talked about the expected decline in GDP being 5%. Of course, one of the big issues with that is it's not going to be evenly distributed. Some industries are going to see less of a decline. It could be that agriculture and mining don't see much of a decline this year, whereas, of course, tourism and hospitality will see significant declines. And so the first thing to be clear about is that it's not going to be an even uh, issue. Uh, we can't just look at averages across countries or regions. The second thing is we need to realize that this disruption uh, the lockdown disruption, or, although we may ease out of lockdown in the next few weeks and months, the disruption of physical distancing, of needing to be careful about travel, of making sure that we don't uh, meet in large groups, that disruption is going to last for 12 to 18 months uh, at, at least. And so the disruption to the workplace is going to be significant. And the real question, I suppose, and this is what scenario planners are asking, is with these disruptions, how many of the disruptions that we might experience for the next 12 to 18 months are going to be permanent uh, as, as we come back? And I suppose that's the question for the future of work. Um, and, and like uh, Ronak, I, I have uh, three points that I, I want to leave you in, in my short time. So the first is obviously the work from home phenomenon. The question is how many people who are working from home now will continue to work from home even when they have the option of going back to, to the office? And maybe work from home is not the right way to think about it. Maybe your home is not a good place to work from. So I think the, the long-term future of work trend here is going to be work from anywhere. So not just work from home, but work from anywhere. And I think what people are going to get used to is the fact that we don't have to go to the office. Uh, we don't have to meet people uh, physically face to face. We don't uh, have to get into rush hour traffic. Many of our African cities are um, clogged up uh, with rush hour traffic. And I'm sure that you might be missing the office, but you're certainly not missing the traffic to get to and from the office. And so maybe we will discover we are way more productive when we are working from home. And so we, we might see uh, opportunities for local hubs, uh, companies moving away from the CBD and, and having smaller meeting places. We might then see the rise of uh, third uh, meeting areas. So businesses um, like the WeWork type setup that provide you with a, a, a flexible office arrangement um, or just moving into the digital space. And that leads to an interesting set of opportunities for Africa. Uh, we know that over the last 20 years, there's been a lot of outsourcing around the world, but a lot of companies in, in Europe and America and, and across uh, even across into Asia have not thought that they could outsource everything. Uh, and now they're going to realize there are a lot of things that don't need to be done in an office. And if you don't have to come to the office, well, then, of course, your talent pool becomes global. And we don't have to worry about flying somebody from a different country. We don't have to worry. Um, you know, America and England were trying to close their borders to, to people coming in for work. Well, now in a, in a digital world, you can outsource your work anywhere in the world. And I think we're going to see a new boom in, in that outsourcing. And this is certainly going to be in Africa's favor, uh, the last continent uh, where we haven't really had an outsourcing boom and where, where uh, 
um, education is, is high and literacy is good and wages might be competitive given our currency situations, um, I think that we could set ourselves up in Africa uh, for that outsourcing boom. And then the third, uh, the third aspect to consider, uh, uh, His Excellency Wene already covered this, uh, and that is regionalization. All around the world, I think people are going to be reconsidering their supply chains. And certainly here in Africa, there is going to be consideration of a variety of different supply chains. Uh, you heard him give examples from uh, manufacturing to pharmaceuticals, and I would certainly uh, agree with his assessment there. That, of course, opens up lots of working opportunities uh, for companies and individuals across Africa. So the main point and the big question is, now that we're facing a year or so of disruption, does it work? What is changing now that might be permanent in the future? And what opportunities does that give Africa? I think that there are many answers to that question, which are in favor uh, of the future of work on the African continent. But Pamela, I'll, I'll leave it there uh, to, to just give those uh, thoughts for people to think about. And if there are any questions, we can pick it up during the Q&A time. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Graham, for those insights. Um, it reminds me of this notion that has uh, now been muted, which is about the low touch economy, which says that yes, sectors like tourism will be affected and hospitality. However, there's going to be a surge in terms of um, working from the internet. And I'm sure a lot of people will actually be pleased to hear what you shared, which is one, we don't have to go to the office and we can avoid rush our traffic, yet at the same time increase our productivity. Um, if I can be biased for a moment, when you mentioned the opportunities about um, outsourcing as an opportunity, South Africa has always had initiatives which are aimed at positioning the country as a global outsourcing destination. So I think now wearing my South Africa hat, I would say we will welcome those who wish to uh, outsource their services to South Africa as a country. Now we are going to move on with our program and give the opportunity to Dr. Anthony Coleman from Afrex Bank. He will give us a broad view of what are the economic challenges and opportunities for Africa post COVID-19. Afrex Bank is an Africa export and import bank. Over to you, Dr. Coleman. Am I okay now? Can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you. May I ask that you start from the beginning, if you don't mind, please? No, I, I, I indicated, I started by saying that thank you for, for inviting me, Pumela, and thank you for for organizing such an event for a timely conversation. Let me, let me start from this perspective. We have all been used to the Africa rising narrative. The 21st century is for Africa. However, time and time again, we have been checked by reality that we appear not to be ready. The issue is this, a building that has weak foundations would always collapse. COVID-19 has once again brought to, to a sharp focus the challenges with the structures of African economies. If we look at Africa, 50 years plus, 100 years plus, we are still relatively commodity dependent. 
with very little manufacturing. Post COVID-19, some of the challenges that are likely to delay Africa's recovery could be uh, escalation of trade protectionism. A lot of countries are going to now look inward as against looking outward. We're going to have restrictions on investment and capital flows. Already it's a challenge. We're going to experience loss of fiscal revenue for a lot of countries that depend on import revenues or export revenues for that matter. Look at the collapsing hospitality sector, the collapsing tourism sector. All these are going to create liquidity challenges for a lot of African economies. The gap, which already is, is a headache, is likely also to be widened. Look at our, our, our health sector. COVID-19 came and relatively, we were, we were brought to understand that we do not have a robust health system to address pandemic of this nature. Unemployment and related issues would also, also be, be, be around. Whilst a place like the US, a place like France, a place like Spain, a place like Germany they have recorded very high numbers of, 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 the, of, the, of the pandemic with several deaths that have occurred over there. Africa appears to have, have experienced or witnessed little in this aspect. But gradually, Africa appears to be becoming the epicenter of the economic impact of COVID-19. In other words, Whilst these countries may be suffering from death and, and infection rates, the real economic impact is rather heavy on Africa. These are some of the challenges that we have. And if I want to, I want to summarize that with, 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 with an Igbo proverb. It says that a bird that flies off the earth and lands on an ant hill is still on the ground. A bird that has a dream that I want to fly off the earth. However, it lands on an ant hill. That bird has gone nowhere. It is still on the ground. What are the opportunities that confront us in the context of COVID-19? It is important for us as a continent to realize that there comes a time in our life where we become resolute and take a decision to be independent. Independence is beyond politics. So we need to be economically independent as well. There comes a time where as a continent, we must take that bold decision to say that we are going to fend for ourselves. It is in this context that, for me, the AFCFTA cannot, could not have come at an opportune time. The AFCFTA must now move at a lightning pace. We have really no time to wait. Within the AFCFTA, if you look at the industrialization pillar, the Inter-African Trade Pillar, you all realize that we are talking about building regional supply and value chains. So we need to pay attention to regional supply and value chains. We must accelerate the process of value addition and industrialization across the continent to enhance our structural transformation agenda. We must consciously make a shift towards the local economy. We're talking about very low level inter-African trade. When you go to a place like Ghana, ask yourself, how much does Ghana trade with Africa? Ghana largely, and it's not, it's not, it's not Ghana alone, other African economies largely we trade with the North as compared to trading within. We must also embrace COVID-19 and then come to the realization that the life that it brought 
has come to stay. We need to shift our focus towards investment in digital infrastructure and digitalization, especially in the context of the fourth industrial revolution. For a lot of us who were never used to working from home, it took time to adjust to the process of now working from home. The other day I was talking to my friend who said that he thinks before we go back to the office, we should have psychologists to come and then assess us and prepare us to go back to the office. The point I'm making is this. As a continent, the AFCFTA is the biggest opportunity that we have given to ourselves. We must therefore invest in resilience so that beyond this shock, we'll be able to withstand any other shock that comes in the future. It is time for us to break down the artificial barriers and unite as a continent. It is time for us to act. Countries that are hesitating coming on board the AFCFTA. Message across that it is together that will make us strong and that will make us stand. I remember my great, 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 great grandfather who had the vision of uniting Africa. I'm talking about Dr. Kwame Nkrumah who publicly indicated that the independence of Ghana was actually meaningless unless it is linked up with the total liberation of the African continent. And by liberation, Kwame Nkrumah did not only mean politically, Kwame Nkrumah also economically. Several decades down the lane, where are we? We should not miss out on the single opportunity that the AFCFTA offers us as a continent. If we miss out, I'm not too sure where we can go to for recovery. We have had meetings about the CFTA. We've had seminars. We've had discussions. We've had a lot of concessions here and there, but we need to move it beyond where it is. Simply because another Igbo proverb, a rolling lion kills no game. It is only when that lion goes out there to hunt that it can, can, it can catch or it can have a game. Once the lion goes around roaring, no game can be fetched. Let's move beyond the, 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 the round table discussions. Let's move beyond the, the rhetorics. Let's move beyond the talks but let's pick the AFCFTA and then implement it with one effort. It is by doing this that Africa can be the beacon that is supposed to be. Everything that we need, all we need is to have that political will and say that we are going to get on board the FCA and drive it forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Coleman, for sharing your views on how we can change the face of trade within Africa. And when you talked about resilience, you are reminding me of a recent study by McKinsey, who has said that post COVID-19, countries and organizations will need to look at five horizons. And these are five things. These are resolve, resilience, return, reimagination, and reform. On that note, I'd like to call upon Agnes Gitau, who is going to give us the, the perspective from the East Africa point of view. I'm sure I'll find myself repeating what everybody else has said, uh, but allow me to share some perspective from East Africa. Like everybody else, 
the pandemic has really been a disaster for the region. We have suffered uh, the economic uh, destruction. We've also suffered uh, destruction in the health sector. But we have not just sat back. We have taken initiative to try a and contain the spread of the virus. At the same time, try and ensure there is an economic, uh, economic activity is ongoing. So what are some of the challenges that the region has faced? Of course, the healthcare infrastructure, our weaknesses in this area has been exposed as every speaker has alluded to. We've also seen a disruption in the supply chain um, to the region. You're aware that East Africa is very much exposed to international trade. So with the borders closed, it means that our import and export markets are obviously, uh, uh, obviously stopped. Uh, the region also is very much dependent on the tourism sector. What, what that means that with the global aviation at a standstill, it means we have no tourists coming to the region and this impacting over 10 million people directly. The regional trade, uh, His Excellency Wam Keller alluded to it. Regional trade with borders closed means that we are not trading with each other. Estimates uh, are about 60 to 50 percent reduction in regional trade. Again, this has an impact on job losses and high rates of unemployment. The agriculture sector, the region suffered because of locust outbreak, which started way in, 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 in December. And also, you're aware that we've had floods in the last two months. In fact, fatalities from floods in East Africa have been more than even the, the impact of COVID-19. Pumela, in your, in your opening remarks, you talked about the, the projection for Africa's growth. Everybody is projecting a contraction on the economy. Fortunately for the region, um, obviously East Africa has always projected high growth if you compare it to the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. We are going to see, of course, a reduction to our growth uh, estimate. Uh, the highest growth is going to come from Ethiopia and Rwanda and Uganda, surprisingly, at around percent. Countries like Kenya, who are very much linked in international trade, will record uh, economic growth of around 1%. This, of course, has great impact again on the economy and revenues for the government. There's been um, intervention by the government like everybody else. Our central banks were very quick to intervene very early on with central bank cutting uh, all the uh, interest rates to provide, uh, to provide liquidity for commercial banks. We've seen governments providing tax relief for low income earners. earners. We've seen a reduction of corporate tax and VAT reduction from, from an international scene, uh, we, we are all aware of uh, countries like Ethiopia and Rwanda amongst the nations who, who benefited from G20 financial relief for poorer countries. countries. Other countries like Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia have all approached IMF and World Bank directly for loans to support the healthcare infrastructure, infrastructure at the same time revive our economies. In the last two months, uh, both the World Bank and IMF have approved an estimated $4 billion for the region in debt and loans. This brings me to the point which uh, Ronak highlighted, Africa's debt crisis. And, and, and a lot of people say that actually Africa doesn't have a debt crisis. What Africa has is mismanagement um, of, uh, of our resources. So pre-COVID-19, the region was already exposed to a debt, debt, debt crisis, as Ronak alluded to. Combined, the region has around $100 billion, both from foreign and domestic, domestic debt. This is quite a challenge. If we are going to continue repaying and servicing this debt, it means that we, we, we are going to neglect some of the key sectors, of course, like the healthcare and others. Kenya and Burundi are the highest, have the highest debt levels, uh, around 60%, and that also is quite a challenge for the region. We have talked about what the future looks like. What what do we need to do if Africa is going to recover from this pandemic? And like everybody else, I think uh, speakers have talked about how it is important for us to build resilient economies, how it is important for us to build local supply chains. And I think that is the case for the re for East Africa, like everyone else. We also need to focus on building distribution centers to meet local demand. A lot of, uh, of our manufacturing sectors are very much dependent on inputs from China and with borders closed, it means we can no longer get those inputs to continue with the uh, manufacturing sector. They have therefore reduced production by over 30%. And this of course has, uh, has affected everybody negatively. The most important thing, and we've all talked about it, is investing in our healthcare system. 
a lot of our African governments committed back in 2001 to commit at least 50% of, uh, of, the, of their budget towards healthcare uh, infrastructure. Unfortunately, in East Africa, it's only Rwanda. Of course, Rwanda is always a leader in a lot of these things who, who have achieved those targets. They At least 20% goes into their healthcare system. We've also seen other countries like Ethiopia, Kenya, trying to put more, more finances into the health uh, healthcare sector. Um, another sector that is of importance, and I think post COVID-19 we need to refocus, is deploying resources to support SMEs. We always talk about the importance of SMEs as the drivers of Africa's economies, but we don't do much. SMEs need to be able to access finance. And I think going forward, financial, financial institutions, DFIs, need to work together to support our SMEs if you're going to recover our economies. Regional coordination. East Africa has been very good. We've had high level meetings, virtual meetings between heads of state, uh, departments like the Ministry of, Ministries of Trade and Health, really to coordinate, um, to coordinate recover, recovery initiatives and also uh, find solutions to, 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 to work COVID-19. Another important issue, and, 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 um, and a lot of us have talked about that, is investing in our digital leadership. What, has, what we've seen, all of us are working from home, all of us are using technology or shopping online. So technology going forward is going to be the leader of, of Africa. We need to invest in uh, our local startups, ensure that they have access again to finance, sectors like agri-tech, logistics, mobile health. These are some of the areas going forward that we need to put our money in. Research capacity and His Excellency Wam Keller alluded to that, and and governance. I think Africa challenges post COVID nineteen challenges of bad management, challenges of politics were there even before this pandemic happened. So if ever we're going to recover, I think we need to address the issues of governance and 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 also citizens must hold our government accountable to ensure that we are keeping to what we promised. Um, never waste a crisis, as they, they, as they say. So there has been some opportunities and deals that have taken place, even in the midst of crisis. In Kenya, I'll give you an example. We have a mobile company called Tala. They recently launched a $5.7 million, uh, $5 million fund to support SMEs. Uh, we've had companies in green, te uh, uh, green technology, and we've also had companies that have invested in in logistic, company, uh, logistic uh, sector, uh, health sector, and also first moving consumer goods. I have some slides on some of the deals that have taken place in the last sort of, in the last five months, and I'll share that with you at the end of this conversation. Um, but to close, really, um, a lot of us have shared of the importance of working together, the importance of opening our market so that we can have free movements and goods and services. But it's going to much more than COVID-19. It's going to take, um, it is going to take, as, as, as Anthony said, is we're going to stop, we have to stop talking and do the right thing. And so going forward, I think we need to come together and realize that we have the resources in the region to be able to address our solutions. And that post-COVID-19, post the challenges of us must be addressed. And that is my seven minutes, Romela. Well done. Thank you very much, uh, Agnes, for sharing uh, with us the fiscal measures that are taken by the different countries within East Africa. Um, another interesting insight that I've learned from East Africa is the rise of what they call the gig economy, where people are having short-term jobs. But I don't want to take too much of your time because we are now nearing the end of our webinar. What I'm going to ask for from the panelists is that they do 30 second responses, you know, 30 second elevator pitch responses to some of these questions. Um, Graham, there are a number of questions for you, but I can summarize them as follows. Um, I think they are really asking about what will be the what will be the impact of digital technology and what will be the future of informal work in the digital economy, and particularly to SMMEs and low end skills. Some of them are even indicating students. So a lot of questions center around that thing. If you can answer that in 30 seconds. <laughs> 30 second challenge. 
I can do my best, Pamela. You, you know, I think what people need to realize is that the COVID crisis is just one of the massive disruptions that is coming our way. All the disruptors that were coming are still coming. So the digital disruption, automation, artificial intelligence, um, the gig economy, all of those are still coming. And in fact, COVID in many industries will have accelerated those. So yes, the answer to the question is we are still headed full speed into the digital economy. Um, and that hasn't stopped. COVID, in fact, probably has accelerated that. Thank you very much. And then the question for um, His Excellency Wamkele Mene is, how can, we how can we determine Africa's readiness for a next global pandemic? And how do we adapt tertiary institutions, uh, uh, and which is the home to tomorrow's leaders for the future of pharmaceuticals on the continent? What needs to change? And the question from me, uh, His Excellency, is what institutes made in Africa? Thank you for the questions. Uh, first, on uh, our, our readiness, I think that when you look at the work that the African Union Center for Disease Control has done in coordinating an effort, um, a, a pan-African uh, um, response strategy to, to this public health crisis is really uh, uh, commendable building on what was done uh, to fight uh, uh, the Ebola uh, crisis a few years earlier. So we are, we are slowly but surely building on our capacity to fight uh, these pandemics uh, in Africa. And I think when you look at the coordinated effort uh, of, of Africa and African governments uh, through the African Union, um, it is actually world class and is comparable to what other regions are doing across across the world. Um, the the second part to the question uh, relating to intellectual property, I think that um, the starting point will be a a, a legal framework, a pan African legal framework um, that that will really be transformative. Uh, in terms of our our IP readiness for future pandemics, uh, because the key, of course, underlying the question, the key is is uh, not just to respond to this question now, to this pandemic now, but to be ready for future pandemics. And then on the other uh, hand, at the same time, to to be addressing uh, public health and industrial development. Um, so institutions of higher learning are very important because that is where you 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 have a hub for research and and development. And as policymakers, I think we 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 welcome collaboration with institutions of higher learning, particularly um, uh, if it combats if if uh, what we learn combats uh, future pandemics in Africa very much uh, what we will do is that we will then send the rest of the questions to each of the panelists so that you answer uh, the questions um, individually to those who have asked I do not want to keep people longer than what we had asked of them and so I'd like to close by uh, sharing my favorite African proverb which is cross the river in a crowd and the crocodile won't eat you. And to me, this speaks to the shared sense of unity, which we as countries around the world should undertake in this time of crisis. No country and no community is exempt from this pandemic. Our president yesterday said COVID-19 COVID knows no borders. COVID-19 knows no nationality. COVID-19 knows no skin color. Therefore, we need to make sure that we deepen our solidarity as nations. And having said that, for Africa, the virus must not delay our developmental agenda. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you for having given us the gift of your time by joining today's webinar hosted by Brand South Africa. Join me in thanking our esteemed panelists who are each experts in their fields for having poured out from the well of wisdom that they each have. 
And allow me to please thank our internal Brand South Africa team, the digital team headed by Matalani Ngobeni and our colleagues Andy Letemba, Tandom Ketu and Roxanne Peters. And I'd also like to thank um, Dr. Petros DeCock and Dr. Judy Smith who are acting as scribes for today and they will be creating an article that will be published summarizing the discussions that have been made today. Thank you very much to each and every one of you. Thank you.